We're at uh, three minutes after, and we've got 10 people in here, so let's go ahead and uh, get started. Hey. Uh, let's do a quick, uh, hey, Neil. Let's do a quick uh, review of the agenda. Take a look at the agenda, and uh, let me know if there's anything that I've missed uh, before we get started, anything you want to modify, change, uh, et cetera. Link to it in the chat as well. Are we good on the agenda? Good. All right. All right, let's uh, start out with uh, release updates with uh, Vadim. Oh, sorry, and folks, don't forget to put your name in the attendees uh, section. Uh, that lets us know who was here and maybe who might have missed in some information. It's important to some of the stuff that they um, Okay, are we ready? Go for it. Um, right, so the, the main highlight of the last two weeks of work has been the release of 4KD48. Um, it took us quite a while to to push it through, mostly because of our strict uh, upgrade um, scenario, where there is no way for us to manually add an edge, so we have to pass it through CI. And CI runs disruption tests, meaning uh, the test would fail if we disrupt uh, services, API, or end-user workloads using router more than 1% uh, during the upgrade. Um, due to an OVN bug, we were disrupting at around 10, 13, 15% in some cases. So uh, we tried to push it through to to prioritize it, but unfortunately, it wasn't it hasn't been fixed. So what we now do is we run the test, the very same test to it, but without the disruption test. So now we can add an edge from 4.7 OKD to 4.8. Um, any further upgrades like from one 4.8 to the other don't need that hack and disruption is within the acceptable limits and so on. And moving forward, we would be more strict about this, but this is a one-time hack we had to do. Um, and thus we now have uh, Finally, more or less updated um, Kubelet version 1.21. Um, I think it's 2 or dot 4. And we'll have a Kubelet Trebase from now on monthly, uh, same as OCP does. Uh, in other news, uh, Christian is probably not here. He's attending, he's attending KubeCon and um, I don't want to steal his thunder, but apparently he's got quite a lot of progress on ARM64 uh, images. So we'll wait for him to, to demo that. Uh, we are also were working on bare metal IPI progress. We have, I think, all the beats finally in place in 410 nightlies. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have 410 nightlies yet. We need to push uh, a few more changes to CI and we'll have them available soon. Um, and another topic we would need to discuss, um, not necessarily today, but soon, is Cgroups v2. In 4.9, we have all things in place, and we just need to decide how exactly do we want to enable them. Um, probably the safest way would be publishing a guide how to do this today. Uh, all you need to do is just one machine config um, then we can enable it for fresh installations and probably in 10 we can um, automatically add this manifest in um, during an upgrade. But again, all depends on the testing feedback we get. Um, and I believe that's all we have uh, for today. There is some work to rebase the 410 to Fedora 35, but uh, we haven't really started it yet. It's just in the plan, so not much to report on. Yeah, we should we should consider uh, the four nine nightlies have just started, right? So we should consider making four nine nightlies just do C group V two by default. Just uh, I think that like before we start getting to RC phases, like we're just doing nightlies of four nine. Let's just do it. Like it's not like the C group V two has been beaten the crap out of in Fedora. So since we run on Fedora CoreOS as opposed to 
rel choreos, this becomes a lot easier because we already know that for the vast majority of cases that you know C groups afflicts, things are in an okay shape now. And so then it's really a, a question of making sure whether the rest of the integration points between OpenShift and and Choreos is okay for this kind of thing. And you know, they're nightlies, right? Like people don't just get auto switched to nightlies. And if we have people like just trying nightlies and we just straight up do C group V2 or nightly upgrades to nightlies, deploys to nightlies, uh, new new deploys to nightlies, let's just do it and see how it goes. Because um, I don't know how else we will get like the requisite feedback to make sure that we're getting this right um, in time for like saying, do we want to do it C group V2 for new installs on stable? Do we want to do it on upgrades? Or do we want to defer upgrades to 410? I think the the best way to be able to get that is just just start doing it in the nightlies, and see how that goes. Well, Plus I'm super um, excited and I want C Group V2 now. <laughs> yeah, the main difference is um, OCP is late in four nine cycle, so we can enable C Group V2. But if we find some bug in builds, Qblad, or something like that, probably kernels implementation is very good now for like but it's been like 10 years or something. But all other places are not that well prepared for C group V2. So if we find a bug there, uh, it would take us a while to actually get it lumped back to 4.9 because we have to wait uh, the freeze before the GA and things like that. So that would take a couple of weeks. Next, how exactly to enable this, we can differentiate between fresh 4.9 installs get C groups V2, the rest are remaining on C groups V1. We can do, everyone gets C groups V2 unconditionally. We can do, uh, here is a guide how to enable it, and we can have a, a dedicated CI job to do this. I'm thinking fresh installs is probably the safest way. We will automatically get this tested in CI. Um, yeah, and my main concern is that existing like things like builds probably would take would take the biggest hit. The kubelet is probably well to find out the work with containers and secrets too, but things like builds are probably the, the riskiest part. And showing this to the new installs would be the best solution. Okay, so um, I think we have a tracking ticket somewhere and I will post uh, an implementation guide there and we'll see where it takes us. Okay. I mean, I'm fine with us doing it for new installs with 4.9 now if we want to. Um, I just, I want to just push the button. I want the button to be pushed for, for C group V2 basically as soon as possible because like part of the problem that I've seen so far with the C group V2 stuff is that we're now stuck in this catch 22 cycle of pain where like we can't shake out the remaining issues with C group V2 until people just straight up start using it um, because that's what happened when Fedora switched to C group V2 by default, like literally zero of the container tooling, virtualization tooling, et cetera, supported C group V2 until the uh, forcing function happened. And because Corios reverted that um, when they, when they, you know, made their releases, um, we never got that back pressure into the Kubernetes world to fix this because nobody was really, doing anything with it. And I just really don't like the fact that this has just been stalled out for so long. And I and a lot of the underlying runtime stuff has been fixed over the years in, you know, 122, Kubernetes 122, which I think is what um, OpenShift 4.9 is actually based on, has uh, support for C group V2. So at this point, I just kind of want to I want us to be a proper forcing function here because otherwise I don't know how how it's actually going to like get over the, the hump. And and realistically I think we understand at this point get bit, given from the the amount of UPI problems that our CI is not a good substitute for real world interactions. Um so while the CI definitely covers a strong subset of it, I want us to just start having users just you know, follow the normal steps as if they were doing an OpenShift deploy and get, you know, OKD 4.9 nightlies 
on a fresh install with uh, Secret V2. Because so I think the, that's, that's the only way to get through it. So I think one of the things, if we look at, um, and actually uh, Timothy is going to be talking about this in a second, uh, if we look at like the FCOS group, um, they have a testing day or testing week, as the case may be. It might be helpful to actually organize that for something like this, call out to the community and say, hey, here's something we particularly want to test. We'll create a little matrix. If you click on the, the link to the, what Timothy's going to talk about, there's, there's basically a, a, a matrix that people can check boxes for installation, et cetera, et cetera. So that might be one way to approach this, right, is to call it to the community, provide them something that they can easily fill in to let us know how it went, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. So who wants uh, to be in charge of that effort? Who wants to, to do the initiative of uh, creating a little grid or uh, penning something that we can send out to the community? Anyone? Neil, I you have the idea. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, it's a great idea. I just, I don't have time right now to do <laughs> I'm already like stretched super thin <laughs> right now. It's a great idea. So someone has to do Yeah, it. it's a great idea. I just hope I hope my enthusiasm would make someone else also enthusiastic about the idea. Like I just got my first demo OKD 4.8 deployment run POCO deployment working uh just just the past day <laughs> in our OpenStack. So like it's been it's been a rough ride so far. My colleague is going to start filing issues and submitting documentation PRs for some of the stuff that turned out to be um, the words I would say are not quite right um, because uh, we encountered some interesting quirks in our in our OpenStack based deployment trying to use IPI um, mostly in the realm of like odd wording incomplete information in some cases and like just some missing coverage and stuff okay we've got some hands raised i want to make sure we get to the folks that have their hands raised uh mike go ahead yeah um in general like i totally i totally agree with neil's kind of optimism enthusiasm etc here I, I like the idea of getting the groups v2 kind of out the door getting people using it the the hesitancy or the, I guess the only thing that would be kind of concerning to me is that like, yeah, we get it out there and get people installing it. And then we get like a glut of people who start to have issues based around something there, which is what we want. But then like, how do we manage the other side of it from the OKD community side? Like, is there someone who's going to be helping to open Bugzilla's or, you know, like having someone in the community to help organize this effort in both directions? I think would be really useful. All right, why don't we do this? Uh, I'll do the guide. Vadim has has uh, volunteered to be the point person on this. So Vadim and I will do the setup for it. And since I actually did a little bit of work on um, the FCOS uh, working groups uh, testing day stuff, I can sort of duplicate the same thing for uh, our group and um, we'll go from there and we'll uh, check in uh, at our next meeting and let you know where our efforts are. Okay, Neil, we're going to get you at some point to do something, though. We we will oh. rope you into. Oh, to I'm something. sure. I mean, there's there's already a couple of things I'm I'm already working on, and and the fact that like I'm finally getting an OKD deployment, uh, working in our in our internal OpenStack, you know, with IPI, like is basically like. That's been like the starting blocker that we've just struggled to get over. And so now that I can have this, I need to make this deployment reproducible so I can blow it away and make it again and again. And then once that's all shaken out, um, I, I'm hoping that I can actually start doing some more interesting stuff because like part of the blocker has been for me is that it's a little difficult for me to do more than just like kind of cursory look at things, try to, you know, guide people and, and help that kind of stuff when I can't actually get the bloody thing running. And now that I have it running, a sort of maybe, I don't know. It just started, it just started working last night. So like, <laughs> that's, well, Keep us uh, posted on your efforts for sure. So that we know <laughs> that you've got the, well, ideally we'd have a matrix of, um, okay, so-and-so has access to such and such resources. And well, yeah, that, that that's kind of like, 
that's kind of, I think, where we want to go here because, like, uh, yeah, I haven't had time to bask in the glory. Like, it, it literally started working at, like, 8 o'clock last night. So it's just like, uh, and then and Dad and I were like, okay, we're done <laughs> for now because, like, <laughs> I could, we could finally log in. We spent, like, we spent a couple of days trying to figure out how to fix the networking so we could actually access the OpenShift cluster. And that was just a whole different set of, of, of issues. So, yeah, like, um, I think it's actually a great idea if we can get like, um, you know, community resources, uh, a, a community matrix of some kind of like, people are using OKD in this particular platform and configuration so that when there are um, things that we need to test, we have a fast track to make sure that those fe things can be evaluated. Like, for example, like my hope is that um, with our new OpenStack deployment that we have internally that we're running OKD on, uh, in our proof of concept setup right now, and I'm hoping to figure out how to productionize it eventually, um, that will make it easy for me to go into the future and say like, hey, we need to test this thing. Can I just like, you know, YOLO a few resources on our, in our internal um, OpenStack to just do some testing and stuff and I'll blow it away afterwards. And they'll be like, yeah, sure, why not? Uh, and that's the kind of thing that um, like, I, that's what I'm, I'm trying to move towards because that way I can say, hey, you know, for OpenStack IPI stuff, I can help. Right, and that's that's the kind of thing that that's really where I want to get to next because like it's a little hard for me to do much else without having the first part in place. And I know, you know, I haven't I haven't actually said it all this much, but like this has been like one of the problems with me trying to do stuff up until now. So like I'm super excited that I finally have something because <laughs> it it it's a real it's a huge also OKD48 looks super cool. Like laying around with the UI, it's very, very nice. Anyway, um, all right. Well, we yeah. will keep us posted and let us know if you can do more than log in and and uh, and automate that. So that'll be helpful. Uh, in similar yep. news, actually, I have access to vSphere again, so I'll be doing uh, my vSphere based testing uh, again and using my Oct stuff, which pretty much automates uh, vSphere UPI. Um, let's see, uh, who else had a hand up? Someone else have a hand up? Anyone? No? Okay. Uh, okay, let's, uh, did you have anything else, Vadim? Did you, maybe as we transition into FCOS, did you want to, um, talk about, uh, issue 210, uh, in OKD Machine OS, the, the conversation that's coming? Uh, between uh, J11 and uh, yourself and uh, sort of what that points to? Yeah, well, we circle back to, rather, Fedora CoreOS team has reached out and told us that rebuilding Fedora CoreOS is a bad idea. Um, I don't know. Um, sometimes we must have different package versions. That's certainly not ideal, so uh, we would need a way to overlay the necessary RPMs, and we don't want to go back to unpack RPMs and layer them as files. That's a, that, that was a terrible decision. Uh, so now what we do is we take a list of packages Fedora CoreOS installs, patch them, add additional ones, and make our own Fedora CoreOS-like-ish um, operating system. That's also a terrible solution, but on a global scale, a better fix would be uh, OpenShift would, rather, machine config operator would one day learn how to layer different images which contain OS3 commits and pack them together and you would have a properly functioning system. But we're pretty far away from that. And the short-term goal is to reuse as much as possible, to reuse artifacts built by Fedora CoreOS uh, project as much as possible so that we could just simply add a couple of packages from us and some configuration files. But there are lots of hurdles in the way. I would appreciate some looks into this discussion. We might want to move this to uh, slash OKD repo because uh, we also want to have a fail safe way to uh, pin some particular um, packages like we have to do now due to uh, Kubernetes issues, but we also don't, are not very excited about rebuilding uh, operating system on every pull, pull request. So um, that's going to be a long discussion, but it feels it would be productive and it, that would help us shape 
the whole open shift in a new fashion because it was mostly the change of why on earth are we building uh, an OS on every pull request? It's us and uh, Railcross as well. We're changing how OpenShift eventually would start overlaying different OS3 commits um, on one system dynamically, just building them from a bunch of images. So that's so, it. So I recall, um, I think it was like six months ago, um, RPM OS tree gained support for being able to enable and layer modules onto it. So like the modular cryo can now be layered um, per matching versions and stuff like that. Um, and I think a few weeks ago, I want to say with the last RPM OS tree release, you now have the ability to replace base packages with over with layered packages. Um, so like if you want to delete a package, and, or replace or swap out something. Um, there is an experimental feature. Um, it's under RPM OS tree EX, I think, get replace or something like that. I forget what the subcommand is, but basically the API exists for now being able to to do mutations like that um, without having to rebuild the entire base um, OS tree image, um, which I think is necessary for certain particular configurations with OpenShift, um, uh, especially if you want to, you know, switch from a non-modular to a modular version of a component in Fedora Core OS, um, which may be necessary for something like using particular versions of Run C or C Run or whatever um, that have both modular and non-modular variants. Um, so that should actually be in place now. Uh, I guess the, the remaining effort would be to wire it up to MCO, if I'm right, Vadim? Yeah, but it still doesn't, it's great and that might find its uses, but that's not the problem we're facing right now. So we initially hit the modularity problem. We kind of worked it around by fixing uh, upstream cryo builds in uh, OpenSUSE.org. Now we build all of them as plain repos and we just mix in the repo there. So mod switching back to mod modularity might be a solution which we would pick, but that, that just feels like additional steps because the very same people build it upstream and the very same people build it in Fedora. So why would they bother running two builds instead of just one? Um, when it comes to replacing a package that might find its uses, but again, some packages are not that easy to replace. For instance, we're now hitting a problem where we have to roll back the Selinux policy. That also brings a bunch of dependencies. So probably we're missing some of the updates because of that. And a simple swap of the RPM won't fix it. The same problem would be if we would want to swap uh, uh, glibc, but on a much larger scale, of course. So these are the problems we would need to discuss in this uh, ticket and find a, a decent solution. Perhaps we might have to fall back to rebuilding in some cases, and the usual happy path would be using Fedora Cross um, artifacts. So all the cards are on the table. We just need to pick which ones to, which features do we want based on quite extensive experience during the last two years. We had all kinds of failures. So I think we have a really good set of features we want from from the, the system so how do we move forward with this then how do we how do we tackle this do we dedicate a period of 15 20 minutes to every meeting and start discussing it or how do we approach this yeah timothy go ahead so yes this ties into the future roadmap for federal courts so can you hear me correctly first mm -hmm. yep okay um so the main idea is that we're trying to move to a model where we have a base image and where we allow people to have customization baked layers that you would ship, uh, just like you would ship container images with the base image and layers on top. Uh, and so the idea that our plan was three would be able to pull the base image and then apply the layers on top on, on, on the OS uh, directly, which fits really, really well with the MCO. Uh, model where we essentially ship the OS as a container and uh, we would just ship like so specific layers on top. So one layer would be, for example, cryo and everything like that. 
uh, or potentially it could be uh, any um, replaced packages or think uh, that uh, that would be of use for for KGB. Um, so we're doing that both for Fedora Chorus and, and of course Red Hat Chorus, the, the OpenShift in, in general. But uh, yeah, the idea is to to, to make this uh, generic, but not fully generic. You won't be able to do all the changes you want in the in the OS, but like that replacing packages and things like that would be essentially uh, possible. Um, so yeah, the the basic idea is not that we don't like people rebuilding Fedora Chorus. Uh, it's that uh, when uh, people do so, well, they lose all the testing that we do. And essentially, we lose all the testing that that everybody else do. So it splits testing in two, and so that's not great for us. Uh, so that means that we essentially never test any. Well, we never ship anything to OKD directly, and OKD never uses Fedora Chorus directly. So we don't. We cannot really use OKD to test Fedora Chorus in CI. Um, so yeah, the basic idea is that we try very much to bring us to uh, closer, so that we can in the end. Uh, make sure that we run OKD end to end testing in CI, for example, in Fedora Chorus, at least for the releases, maybe not for PRs and everything, but at least for the release, like making sure that when we do a release, that is end to end testing on OKD, which will be like the basics. Uh, so, yeah, so that nicely uh, turns out into the notes I have of this meeting, um, which is, yes, which is around testing mostly. So, we have a testing week, right, which, happen, which is happening right now, uh, where we're focusing on Fedora 35 changes. So we're rebasing for Fedora 35. This uh, time we're going to try to rebase really, really close uh, to the Fedora 35 release. So it's going to happen like something like the day or the week. Uh, I don't remember the like, details, but it's going to happen really, really close to the release. So right now, Fedora 35, so the next stream is based, uh, sorry, the Fedora Chorus, the ne next stream is based on Fedora 35, and um, the testing stream will be rebased uh, sometime later. Uh, so any help here to test would be great, and hopefully um, that won't break too much things in OKD2. Uh, that's where we need the most testing, probably. Uh, and uh, yeah, and so we have full ARCH 60, for support right now, you can find the artifacts on the domain page and everything like that. And on the same, yeah, on the same theme of testing, we are trying to bring Kubernetes. So upstream, upstream Kubernetes is doing end-to-end -end testing on Fedora Chorus node with Cryo, and we're trying to bring that into our own CI so that we can at least for the release too, maybe at the beginning, uh, test at uh, the upstream Kubernetes test. Us um, with Cryo on, on Fedora Chorus. So, all that should bring us much, much, much closer to having, making sure that most of those things like work in a default OKD installation uh, for in Fedora Chorus, like without any changes, of course. Uh, yeah. And then potentially having full OKD testing in Fedora Chorus CI. So, yeah, the goal of this is, uh, is very much not to to shame anybody on on building Fedora Chorus, not the point. Uh, it's more about uh, making sure we don't duplicate testing. Okay, excellent. So, I, um, what I'd like to do is keep this ticket, uh, and this is um, again number two ten, issue two ten in OKD Machine OS. It's in the notes. I want to keep this. Um, in our meeting uh, regularly so that we talk about this regularly so that it doesn't slip by and that we can continuously um, address it. And also, uh, I'll make sure that folks have um, ample warning when the FCOS testing is coming up so that um, we can leverage our resources to test FCOS uh, underneath uh, the various uh, OKD releases um, and try those together. Uh, Timothy, do you want to move on to uh, the rest of what you have? Uh, I think I've covered most of what I have, so if uh, there aren't any specific questions, uh, we can go ahead. 
All right, uh, let's move on now to Docs, Brian. Okay, so um, we've done most of the work to switch over the MKDocs to IO site. Now just waiting for Red Hat to change the DNS over. So the MOS has gone to main, the GitHub's automations kicked in, that's all in place now, and the CNAME's been added to it. So it's all ready just to switch over. Um, as it says in the, um, the notes, we've incorporated um, how to change the official docs. So that's the docs, okd.io, the, the product documentation. And we've also got a section how to update the okd.io site within the new content. If you want to have a look at it, if you go to the repo and go to the GitHub pages um, being served by GitHub, um, you can actually see the new site, um, but hopefully soon we'll get that switched over in the DNS. Um, not really much more to add to that. Uh, another thing that came up uh, that uh, I think uh, Michael was on the call. Yeah, Michael's still here. Uh, so Michael is helping us with um, an issue where there's 4.9 references in the OKD docs. Uh, so, um, Michael, is there any update on that? Uh, in terms uh, of yes. Okay. We updated that main OKD docs. Docs.okd.io docs page now has version selector for 4.0 docs. Awesome. And we dropped Thank some of the so earlier much. versions of 3. Awesome. So, right. So, Very let great. me know if that's what you all expected or yeah. any other yeah. improvements we can make. Let me know and we can take care of it. Awesome. Thank you so much, sir. We'll take a look at that. And then, folks, uh, if you run into any issues or you want to see something different, um, let the docs team know, and then we'll bring it up uh, at the docs meeting. Uh, we'll talk about that there. And uh, Diane grabbed a code of conduct. Um, and so this is uh, uh, pilfered from the Ansible folks because they actually ran it through a bunch of legal. So check that out and then we'll take a vote on it um, at the next full group meeting. Uh, basically, uh, the idea is that we'd have this code of conduct in place uh, on the website and also announce it just like CNCF does at the beginning of our meetings, uh, just to make sure that, that people are aware that any event or thing related to the group um, adheres to the code of conduct. So take a look at it. If there's changes you want to make, suggestions, if something's unclear or anything like that, um, uh, be prepared with those. Maybe write them out and send them to the larger group, and then we can talk about them uh, at the next meeting. Any questions have, on that? I did create a, a docs PR. It's, okay. So if you do want to make comments, you can make comments directly in the docs PR. Okay. Or in the GRE issue, either way. Okay. Excellent. And we'll put a link to that up there. Oh yeah, I should have that. I'm sorry. It's in the it's in the uh, Jira issue. Okay. Two four four. Okay. Two, two. Uh, okay. And Sandro uh, is not here, uh, but you can see the uh, updates there. And I'll read these off really quick, just to okay. So for the for folks that don't know, the OK virtualization special special interest group of OKD. Um, actually, Brian, why don't you go ahead and read these off since you're, a lot of this deals with stuff that you're uh, dealing with in terms of the website and everything. Okay, so um, they're moving their docs to OKD. Um, they initially did set up their own site, so they, they, have, they have raised a pull request to actually move that over. Um, that actually did raise um, a couple of issues um, around conversations we had at this meeting two weeks ago around social media. Um, they, they've created their own social media communities. Um, so there was a question of, as, as this group, did, are we okay with that? As we sort of decided not to do um, social media for OKD, um, having a work group that has a social media presence, is that something that, um, you want to support. So that's sort of an open issue. Um, 
initially they actually altered the doc page and they put a whole bunch of custom CSS and some HTML to actually put like a Twitter tracker on their page. Um, didn't like the way they'd implemented that. So asked them that to actually do that as a template. Um, so the page stays pure markdown. Um, they've decided to actually remove that tracker. Um, there's a, there is an open question on a pull request are we okay with their social media links? So that's an open question. Um, other than that, um, within the work they're doing, um, they've successfully tested OTD 4.8 installation on bare metal UPI, um, and they've got a guide for it, and they're gonna put that onto a page on the OKD site. And they're working with the rook.io community to get rook set operator um, to the community OKD operators, um, which I think is going to be goodness all around. Um, and then they're working with assisted installer project to support OKD virtualization um, as well. I don't know if anybody else knows any more about that. Um, and then they're also adding automation for testing a hyper-converged cluster operator with OKD, and I've got a link to that, um, which is in the Hack MD notes. I don't know if there's any questions come out of that. Um, ideally, we, we want an answer. Do we want to support social media? If, are there any objections to that, or how do we feel about that as a group? Yeah, I mean, does it does it make sense for us to sort of promote their own social media? Basically, it's their social media, right? That they want to have their own social media for the subgroup or special interest group, as they're calling it. So, if the docs group sort of decided against doing one of our own and instead like having it go through the OpenShift uh, Twitter and whatnot just because we don't really have people to man something like that ourselves right now. And plus there's a wider audience if we go through um, the OpenShift Twitter and um, commons and stuff like that. Yeah, I, mean, I think a lot, a lot of this depends on, are they already using that Twitter? Is that already like an established communication channel for them that their users are expecting? Because if that's the case, I don't see the harm in having a section on their docs that says like, you know, for updated information, go here. But I agree with Brian, like we don't necessarily need to have the embedded, you know, iframe showing like the scrolling tweets that are happening in real time or something like that. Yeah, they, they do have, um, uh, they do have their, their Twitter is established. They have 62 followers. All of those followers sort of came at once. Um, and it looks like they post every, like, once a week or a couple times a week or something like that since they started it. Um, but there's not a lot there. So, yeah, I don't know that we'd want to scroll because if you have a scroll of, of social media that doesn't have really any updates, it, it actually doesn't look so, you know, which is what Diane's concern was about ours, right, if we did. And I, I agree with that concern. If you have a social media and it never does anything, like it, it kind of makes you look more dead than if you didn't have one, right? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I I mean also, Brian, and then Mike. Okay, I, I was gonna say, I also think um, in a way it's disconnected that group from the rest of us because they don't use any of the communication channels that the other working groups use, this main group, the documentation group. Um, so I, I think several people on this meeting wanted to be involved in the project and nothing comes through any of the other OKD channels. You have to go and use their social media um, to find out there's even meetings going on. They're, they're, they're not plugging into any of the established communication channels that the OKD community would, would know about. Well, we can, we can fix some of those things. So for example, um, I have access to the calendar, the Fedora calendar, and a couple other folks here, we could add a Fedora calendar event for them, um, which would post to the working group mailing list that automatically gets sent to the working group. Um, we could, I don't know, Diane hasn't gotten back in, in terms of how timely 
forwarding stuff through the OpenShift Twitter would be, but we could theoretically forward either a fresh message or whatever or could be posted directly from the OpenShift Twitter or the OpenShift Twitter could forward what they have either way. Um, it, it definitely does feel splintered uh, a little bit, but some of that might be our part of being overwhelmed and not doing enough to get them sort of. Yeah, I, I, I think I, once their website is within ours, then it, it changes things a little bit. Yeah, I, I, yeah, it just feels that we obviously want to support them and we want to get people using and testing and playing with their stuff. And I'm just, I just don't know how people find their, their stuff if they're on the either the Slack channel or they're, they're listening to the um, Google group mailing list or um, anything. It's... Well, let's, I'll touch base with them. Um, Diane was talking about setting up a meeting with them, another meeting with them. Let's set up another meeting. Let's invite them again, because I think Diane invited them again. Let's try again to, to have them get some representation here. And this is another thing is, is they're, all of their members are from one particular region, right? So it's kind of the inverse of the situation that we have right now a little bit. Um, Timothy, it's a little bit later. I think it's like, what, 8 p.m. there or something like that for you. You know, so it's it's a little bit later for some other folks here. But generally, we can all sort of attend. With them, it's like very different, you know, uh, availability. So um, let's invite them again, and then we'll go from there. Does that seem like a plan uh, just to get more conversation going? Yeah, cool. Yeah, I was just going to yeah. say, like, I didn't, you know, like, I, given what Brian's kind of talking about and what in the discussion here, like, it, I think it's right. There's less value to include, like, their Twitter stuff in the official docs. You know, it's perfectly fine if that's the way they're going to, you know, they want to have their Twitter and kind of do stuff there. But I would, my preference would be to see like, yeah, how do we do outreach to that virtualization group so that we can get kind of the support of the full like OKD community behind them. So rather than saying, well, you guys have your Twitter and whatnot, like how do we be more inclusive so that we can get your message out along the channels that, you know, we're preferring to use? Yeah. All right, well, let's do that. Is anyone interested, anyone else interested in being in on, on a meeting with them if we have to do something sort of outside of the bounds of this meeting to accommodate their time. Anyone else want to be in on that? I'll, it'll probably be Diane, myself, and Brian. Anyone else? All right. Well, we'll do it. Mike, you were you heading in that yeah, direction? Thing? Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm happy to join and help facilitate however I can. I don't, I don't have a lot of specific technical knowledge going into that virtualization group, but, you know, yeah, I mean, I'm happy just to help from a community perspective. Well, I think sure. from a community perspective, you're you're good at facilitating. So um, let's do that. <laughs> uh, all right, let's move on now to uh, uh, before before we move on. I I had my hand up before. I just I wanted to ask Brian a question, a uh, technical question about the docs. Um, are the work are the work are the workflows there working properly? Because I. I tried to clone something out of the workflow and one of the directories was not looking quite right for me. So I didn't, I just wanted to ask, I, you know, I didn't open up a bug or anything cause I wasn't sure your tool chain was a little bit different than the one I was using. So I just didn't know. Um, as far as I'm aware, yes. So obviously the, okay. the automation, the automation is fully on um, GitHub. It uses GitHub actions to do all the builds on, on PRs. Um, if you find a problem, please let me know. Because um, obviously I'm aware people use different operating systems and then we may have to update the instructions. So yeah, just ping me and. No, no, I mean, if it's, if it's, if you're seeing it working coming out of that repo, then it was probably just a configuration issue that I was, that's all good. Okay. And this actually came up at the docs meeting is how do we document how folks can contribute to the documentation and, you know, um, being able to use pod like a, a, a container with like Podman uh, to run the software and stuff like that to generate the site and stuff like that. So docs on that forthcoming so that everyone can sort of participate in. Yeah, I'm also thinking of adding a dev file. So anyone that wants to use Code Ready Workspaces or Che can also do it on cluster. That would, now that would be awesome. That would be super awesome. 
And a big round of applause for Brian and, and the awesome work that he's done. This has been like very, very helpful uh, uh, to fix our, our web presence. Uh, okay, moving on to the next piece of business is um, the release change log. Uh, Vadim, you weren't at the last meeting, but this came up. And um, if you're still around here, can you explain a little bit about what happened with the change logs? And we've received several issues related to the change logs and the commits look like they disappeared and whatnot. Yeah, they did disappear, in fact. Um... The problem is we have two forks and uh, which is installer and MCO. So every time we make a new MCO release, we pull in changes, rebase hours on top and push them. So the old commit, unless it gets tagged or somewhere, it gets pruned by GitHub eventually. And uh, the change logs are dynamic. Uh, they are kept in cache. So when I check them, they are looking fine because the GitHub hasn't pruned it yet. And when I look back after a week, uh, the GitHub has pruned the commit, change log has been uh, evicted from the cache, it tries to fetch it, GitHub doesn't find the commit, and we get uh, we get literally nothing. Uh, the current solution is we, well, we got away, installer is merged in 4.9, so that problem goes away, would go away eventually. The MCO issue still remains. Uh, my current workflow is that I tag with some nonsense tag, like for seven and current date, like October uh, 12th, uh, push the tags and so on. So the solution is manual, just to make sure that GitHub keeps all the comments. But uh, coming forward, what we need is, well, either onboard or um, fork correctly, but that would prevent us from rebasing our changes on top. We cannot force push comments there. We would have to we would have to merge all the coming changes between our commit and the previous one we rebased upon. So that's pretty tricky. Or we have to stick to well being careful and uh, tagging the existing commits. Um, there is a CLI command which can build you the difference between to uh, images and uh, OC admin info has something like that. You can build a change log between two. So it's never gone, but it might be unavailable for some time in a uh, release controller. So that's that. Not much we can do about this because of the hacky way we build machine, or, machine config operator and installer for some time. Can we add something to known issues so that people are aware of this and we can? so that if we keep getting tickets on it, that we can just point them to something without having to repeat. Yeah, process. probably it would be a good idea to file a PR which mentions that ticket in the known issue so that we won't have duplicates. Um, we can also come up with a manual workaround, finally codified properly. OK. Good. All right, uh, there wasn't anything, did anyone want to pull anything out of the discussions section of the repo? Did we have any discussions come in that were stood out in any way? I didn't see anything and pull anything out, but if folks saw something they wanted to discuss real quick, we got a few minutes. Nothing, okay. Uh, and um, new business, and this brings it up. So location of the main repo main community. Uh, Vadim, we talked about this at the docs group. We talked about this at the main group meeting two weeks ago. The idea is that there's a lot of push to get a, sep a, a repo that we can all participate in, right, as opposed to this current one. Um, basically, it's you and Diane, some people who uh, aren't really involved much, you know, and Christian, I think. So are, is there any downside to just a new Git repo and moving this stuff over? Um, obviously, Diane's going to do some looking in terms of like any legal stuff. She said she was going to do that. Um, but do you see any downside to just moving issues and discussion and the other sections uh, into a repo that we can then control access to? that more people can participate. 
Now that will work, but the problem is we cannot be part of OpenShift organization because everyone there has to be right. Red Hat employees and it's like centrally controlled by CI. Um, sure, but so we... moving out of the org, maybe a new org. Yeah, right. it's just a matter of naming. Um, yes. Maybe we should move to GitLab or some... The, the I would only problem is finding a nice name. Yeah, yeah. OpenShift CS uh, organization, uh, Diane can find us somebody who can create a repo. It just adds a small uh, post fix there, so. Well, so in the docs meeting, we talked about that a little bit, and apparently that's the OpenShift CS stuff is two people who like gave her access and ability, and those people have like moved on. And there's other people who've moved on and they've changed their name multiple times. So the just the, the docs group and the discussion in there and, and the dis discussion that the main group had two weeks ago was just a completely fresh org and repo. So not connected to, do you see any downside to that? No, it shouldn't be. If OKD is, OP, OKD is an organization, that would be nice, but we would still have quite a long confusion period where people don't know which repo to file tickets at and things like that. Uh, but other than that, I think I think it should be fine, yeah. Does anyone else have any thoughts on that? Is anyone opposed to the idea? Is there a downside that you think makes it more, uh, the benefit smaller than uh, the downsides? Okay, so I guess everyone is Question? enthusiastically. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, th did I miss here? I thought I heard Vadim say GitLab. No, I he said GitLab, yes, and I seconded that, yes. And uh, so I, I'm using GitLab as well, self-hosted version, uh, but uh, the world seems to be against us. So maybe Vadim could say a little bit more about what was in his uh, thoughts. Yeah. Oh, I was just thinking we could have a nice URL, gitlab.com slash okd or maybe slash openshift and host there so that we would not be controlled by our CI, which prevents us from using github slash openshift. Um, my only concern is naming. Uh, a lot of other problems I'm pretty sure we can tackle. Um, if we can use different git hosting for our repos, that sounds good. Uh, I'm pretty much open to suggestions. It's just a matter of getting a cute name so that we could list them all on our pages and people would not get confused. Where do they file issues and where do, do they discuss different stuff? And I'll be honest, I like GitLab a little bit better just from a technical perspective. So there's a little more yeah, functionality. Because they also have a Trello-like uh, task board, yeah. which I haven't found on GitHub yet. Well, pretty much they're all they they have one. Uh, it's, GitHub it's has one. We've used it for the meetings early on. Yeah. The GitHub one is just bad. That, that's the only problem with it. It just kind of sucks because it's super hard our, to connect our, into issues and things like that. And it's it's not it's not easy to connect them to work uh, connect work items to task items to schedules. Like it's it's a very rudimentary and and frankly quite annoying implementation. Um, as opposed to both GitLab and Packer, which tie cards on the board to actual issues themselves. And right. so the tracking of work items is synchronized with the tracking of issues. Yeah. All right, I don't wanna to spend too much more time on this. We've got four minutes, we've got a couple more things to do, but it sounds like everyone's on board. At the next meeting, we'll devise a plan for uh, starting to move things to a new place. And at that point, Diane can chime in with what she learned from legal. Uh, CRC subgroup, uh, uh, sorry, Timothy, yeah. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. You're... Oops, 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 okay, sorry. My only concern with moving to GitLab is how much pro support do we have in GitLab? Like, can we still use the current CI and everything? Or is it just for non-production repos? I think the idea is that we are not using Prow anyway for any of our stuff as the OKD working group to begin with. So it is a non-factor. Yeah. So it's, we're not um, using and, it for any and nobody. Based, uh, nobody in the working group can use Prow at all anyway. That is yeah. deeply okay. controlled by Red Hat employees, so it is not useful to all True. the rest of us. True. Yeah. 
Okay, so then so we will move essentially all the oh. non uh, building repos uh, to this right. org and keep like the. Okay, all right. Yeah, exactly. It's that weird thing with Red Hat where they have open source projects and they support community, except you can't get access to the resources for those projects to do you can, this year. You can make PRs. Like, and we can approve them that they are safe to test because you can make a malicious PR which exposes some of our secrets. That's the reasoning behind this. Sure. You cannot be the owner of the repo, so I'm not feeling excited about um, okay to testing every single PR we do for our working group. So probably Prow is just not a good fit for us. But anything code wise, anything which lands in uh, OKD release image, it absolutely must use GitHub. It absolutely must come from OpenShift. Uh, repos and must use a uh, prowl, yeah. But in yeah, terms of management, of the OKD of... website, the documentation stuff, any of those right. things, none of yeah. those have to. None of our yeah. working group items have to. None of our scripts, none of our tools, none of those have to. Right, exactly. Okay, uh, CRC subgroup. Uh, Neil, do you have an update on that? No. <laughs> no. Okay, no update on it. That's fine, that's fine. Bare metal testing CI uh, group. There was discussion about that. We'll talk about that next week uh, or next meeting. Um, the office hours is tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern. Uh, promote the link. Uh, oh, I don't have the link there, but uh, I'll put the link uh, in the document. Share it out via your social media. Diane has shared out via Twitter and whatnot. Um, and it's myself and Vadim, you're going to be there. Uh, who all is going to be there? It's um, Charo, myself, Timothy, and I think there's like four or five of us uh, that are going to be there. So uh, it'll be lots of fun. It's only half an hour, but hey, it's something during KubeCon, uh, which is cool. Uh, and this will be the last time I think that we have Chris Short sort of uh, narrating for us since Chris Short is moving on uh, greener pastures. Um, okay. I I think that is it. Uh, uh, we're at time. Anyone have any last minute things? No? All right, well, cool. Yes, please promote the event tomorrow. And um, Vadim and I will talk about uh, the things that we have on our task list. And uh, there will be a new task list written up based on this that will be added to the notes, and then I'll send an email out with the tasks and who's responsible for them uh, so that we can be a little more timely with our tasks and a little more on top of them. Awesome. Thanks, folks. Talk to you next time.